from Wingate University and WUTV. This is Wingate Today. Hello and welcome to Wingate Today. I'm Jeff Atkinson. It's one of the fastest growing professions in the world today, with job opportunities expected to grow by 20% over the next decade. The field is respiratory therapy. To deal with the demand, Wingate University is launching a new major, Bachelor of Science in Respiratory Therapy, and will begin the program in the fall of 2016. Respiratory therapists work closely with doctors to diagnose, treat, and educate patients with asthma, emphysema, and a wide range of other respiratory problems. The field is growing thanks to an aging population and advances in disease prevention and detection. Right now, there are no full four-year programs in the state, only 60 in the country. Wingates would be the first in North Carolina. A second major Wingate plans to add is the Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences. Starts next January. It will offer students in pre-pharmacy and other healthcare programs an option should they choose to pursue a different medical pathway. It's the most construction happening on campus at one time. Six different projects are either underway or in the works. They include a new 96-bed residence hall at the entrance to campus on Wilson Street, the Bullock Music Center and Henson Art Museum, both additions to the Bat Center, a new soccer field house, the old Wellspring, which commemorates the school's founding, and a 56,000 square foot health, recreation, and wellness center expected to open in fall 2016. A new dining option has arrived in Wingate. This is what it looked like in early February, a pizza hut on Main Street, just days away from opening. The 1,800 square foot restaurant has inside seating and serves lunch and dinner and is open late on weekends for the college crowd. This is the fourth pizza hut in Union County. By the way, the building the Pizza Hut is in has been placed on the National Register of Historic Places. The strip of four buildings in downtown Wingate, just north of the railroad tracks, was built between 1904 and 1925. It once housed a general store, dress shop, bank, and drug store. On the subject of history, we have a story about a local dentist who's donated some historic works of art. Dustin Etheridge is at the Bat Center to fill us in. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. Inside this gallery, there hangs eight pieces of art that for five years hung on the wall of a dentist's office in Wingate. And now, well, they're at the university to stay. I was an accidental art collector, I guess. Dr. Lee Bates' love affair with art began when his family took an art auction cruise in 2005. But what got me started going was they had a large photograph of Muhammad Ali and the Beatles that was taken in February of 1964, uh, and then it was signed by Muhammad Ali in 2004. This is what started the whole thing. I did get the Beatles and Muhammad Ali picture, uh, and then got caught up in it, and we ended up buying a lot of other things. Those other things include these seven etchings from Rembrandt, a Dutch artist from the 1600s, and a print from graphic artist Peter Max. For five years, they hung on the walls of the exam rooms at Bates' practice. When he and his wife decided to move, he chose to give the pieces to Wingate. We're in probably the stage of our lives where we're going to be downsizing, um, and the house we're building in the mountains is more windows than it, and doors than it is anything else. There's going to be limited wall space. Bates' lack of wall space aside, his intimate connection to the Wingate community is only amplified by a family matter. My youngest daughter had graduated college uh, at NC State, but then she applied and was accepted to the physician assistant program at Wingate. Bates' daughter graduated in December of 2013, and he thought, why not give them to Wingate? Dr. Bates actually called me, and we had an initial conversation just about the idea of him donating art that was in his practice. Hannah Dickerson, the assistant vice president of resource development for Wingate University, admits she was a little stunned when she realized just exactly what Dr. Bates was offering. So as we started to talk a little bit more about the process, he told me that they were Rembrandt etchings, which I was completely floored. Hannah Dickerson and I went to the dentist's office. Charlene Bregier is the gallery director at the Bat Center, and artist herself, she's quite familiar with Rembrandt and the painstaking process that goes into creating these etchings. He used some engraving tools to be a part of the etching process that no one had ever combined before. Being a dentist, did that give you any kind of appreciation for the type of work that went into these art pieces? I think it did, and uh, you know, that was, like I say, some of it was just realizing what it took to do that. That it's, it's one thing to 
take a pencil and draw something or, or a brush and paint something, but to do something backwards with a, an etched line and then putting acid in it and, and coming out with something that is as definitive as, as those things are, I can't imagine how difficult that was. And that difficulty is something Bregier hopes students will glean from this donation. I would say to all, the, all those students that can use these for papers uh, in the subject matter, where, whatever avenue you take to look into Rembrandt's life, whatever lens you choose, just um, try to get into the head of what made this guy tick. The donation of the art pieces to the university has been met with broad acclaim from around the region, with multiple newspaper articles, a few television segments, and countless internet postings. Dickerson calls it an unexpected response. It's such a generous gift from Dr. Bates and his wife, so we were thrilled by it, but we had no idea that the public would think of it as much as we did. I myself have no art talent. And with this gift from Dr. Yeah. Bates, these timeless pieces of art will forever be enshrined here at Wingate. A reminder of one man's creative genius and another man's okay. humble generosity. And in the five years that these etchings hung at his practice, Dr. Bates says only three people knew exactly what they were looking at. And in case you're wondering the total value of these seven Rembrandt etchings and that Peter Max print, just under $40,000. From the Bat Center for Wingate Today, I'm Dustin Etheridge. Jeff, back to you. Thanks, Dustin. A date's been set for an historic groundbreaking in the Western North Carolina mountains. March 19th, they'll break ground on the Joint Health Education Center, a state-of-the-art, high-tech facility that will house Wingate's Hendersonville campus, Blue Ridge Community College, and Pardee Hospital. The project is a joint public-private partnership between the state, county, city, and Wingate that local leaders have called a game changer. The facility is expected to open in June 2016. The latest on the presidential search. Tom Williams, chair of the committee leading the search, gave a brief update at a faculty meeting in late January. Nearly 200 have applied for the position to replace Jerry McGee as Wingate president. I'm glad to hear how many people want to be the president of Wingate University after Jerry retires. They all know they have a hard act to follow. The finalists chosen for the job are expected to visit campus in early March, with a successor being named sometime this spring. With a new president on the way, the university is also launching a new website. Why is that important? Check this out. Nine out of 10 enrolled students say they use the internet to research their school options, where they wanted to go to school. And a strong web presence is crucial in the competitive world of higher ed. Today's consumers are digital shoppers first. More than 80% of people say they begin the purchasing process searching online for information. And that includes where to go to college. There's probably a small handful of companies worldwide that do what we do. Bryce Bay runs Inveritas Group, a content marketing firm based in Greenville, South Carolina. Bay founded a company in the 90s called 10best.com, worked with some of the biggest companies in the world. He sold part of 10best.com five years ago to USA Today kept the rest, and turned it into an internet marketing service with a unique name, Inveritas, Latin for In Truth. That's the, the whole idea with the name, is pre creating truthful information, providing updated, factually relevant information is the whole secret, if you will, to successful content marketing. You know, as, as a lot of people will, will, or I've always said, you can't get caught telling the truth. EVG, as it's known, specializes in developing and designing content for websites. It's the group Wingate University signed on with to develop a brand new redesigned website. The things that this new redesign will address are making the website tell more of a story. What is the story that Wingate is telling to its students, it's to itself? What are the unique aspects that set Wingate apart to make it the special and unique experience that it, that it is? She says by using images and video, in addition to the words, they'll tell that story. But there will be far fewer words, about 250 per page. Some pages in the current website have four times that, and that's too many, according to Kathleen Gossman, who will oversee the project. The average person spends maybe 15 seconds on a page to glean everything that page needs to tell them. And we're seeing current pages that have 500 to 1,000 words. So we're going to be restructuring text quite dramatically. Another major difference, the current site isn't mobile friendly. The new one will be. 
Teenagers, young adults, 78% of them have cell phones. A quarter of them use their smartphones as their primary way to get to the internet. Reaching the target audience is what the website's all about. Bryce Bay. We know probably more about how to use digital information to drive specific actions than most any company in the world. And I think we can help Wingate University develop the strategies and, and the techniques they need to carry that university forward. And that's what we want to do. Timetable for the redesign rollout. Phase one, which includes the main website, wingate.edu, should be ready by August 1. Phase two, redesigning the graduate and professional program site and the alumni website will begin mid-summer and be completed by November. Wingate students got a powerful reality check on the issue of poverty from a woman who's experienced it firsthand. Dr. Donna Beagle has devoted her life to dispelling myths and stereotypes about homelessness. Kristen Johnson joins us now to tell us about her inspiring story and how it impacted students. Jeff Donna Beagle was born into a migrant family, homeless for 28 years, and the only member of her family not to be incarcerated. Against those odds, she went on to complete her doctorate and now tries to educate others on believing they have the power to resolve the problem of poverty. As you're about to hear, the lesson hit close to home for one Wingate student. The explanation behind Karen and Rawlings' tears can be found on this single sheet of paper. I wrote down what I knew. And what Rawlings knows is something Donna Beagle knows about too, poverty and homelessness. I grew up in deep generational poverty, which basically means most of my family members can't read and write. My mother is disabled. She has multiple sclerosis. Yes, we get disability and it was $6.50 a month. Yes, our rent was $7.50 a month. So I understood exactly what she was talking about when she was saying, how are people living you know, below the poverty line supposed to afford for these things and raise a family and this and that. Charlotte, North Carolina, where Rawlings' family now lives, was recently ranked last in a study among the country's 50 largest metro areas, measuring how likely it is for children to get out of poverty as adults if their parents were poor. Donna Beagle admits few people who start out in her situation end up like her. But here she is, against the odds, with a doctorate degree and determination to change the mindset about poverty. So we've got the media as our number one teacher of poverty, so the stereotypes are rampant, and we've got a, you know, we've got a couple hundred years to undo about this belief system that if you just work hard, you'll make it, even though the labor statistics say, no, you won't, you need education or a skill. Beagle believes universities have a major role to play by embedding a curriculum across all classes that impresses upon students the correct facts and figures surrounding homelessness. I don't care if you're teaching math. Use the statistics on poverty to teach it and watch people go, I didn't know that, or writing or research or education or humanities or whatever, business, you're going to be a business leader, you still need to know about poverty. We know poverty is an issue, we know homelessness is an issue, but do we really care? That's the question. So I feel like she opened the eyes of my class to things that I feel like this whole entire community of Wingate should know. I think it's empowering for the students who are living it. And I think it's incredibly powerful, the students who haven't, to give them that lens so that they then are doing amazing things. Beagle says she's implemented an opportunity community model in cities and colleges across the country. She points to one college in particular where 70% of students were from poverty and only had about a 40% graduation rate. After getting poverty coaches in every discipline, building partnerships with a community that eliminate barriers like transportation and childcare, Beagle says in three years they have increased graduation rates to 92%, Jeff. That's impressive. Thanks, Kristen. Incoming students in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program were challenged to uphold the professional standards of their respected profession in a professional commencement ceremony held in the Bath Center in mid-January. Guest speaker was Dr. Joshua Clayland, a physical therapist and researcher in New Hampshire. Everything in your personal and professional lives is about to change as you embark upon this wonderful journey through PT school. Faculty presented the 42 students in the class of 2017 with their ceremonial white coat, representing the beginning of their three-year studies to become a doctor of physical therapy. This is the second cohort. The program began in January 2014. Which brings us up to our alumni spotlight. Wingate Today contributing reporter and 1995 alum Brian Stevenson joins us. Who are we featuring? Well, Jeff, this time a personal friend and 96 alum Derek Skinner has had a successful banking career, but he's also making a name for himself on the basketball court. 
Ultimately, that's where we'll end up at. Derek Skinner started his career at Wingate as an admissions counselor. He then served as programs coordinator at the Jesse Helms Center. But seven years ago, he found a career he loves at bb and I think uh, my good college friends laugh every time they know that I'm in finance. Because <laughs> uh, I never would have imagined I would have ended up in the banking world. Uh, you know, my undergraduate degree was biology and chemistry. Um, and kind of fell into the finance piece of it as I had finished my MBA. But I've said it once, I've said it many times, uh, this is what I'll do for the rest of my career. I'll be involved in banking, no questions about it. After completing bb and leadership development program, Derek was placed right back in Monroe with his wife and kids, a placement he was very happy about. I love it because uh, I am still uh, get to be a part of that campus. You know, occasional athletic events here or there, but more or less, you still get involved with those students. You still see your professors that you worked with. And then as a professional, uh, you get to interact with those guys for nonprofit events and, and whatnot. Uh, so you still are relatively engaged with this campus. After the banking day is done though, Derek heads out to his second love as a high school basketball official. Another job he didn't expect to find himself in when he left Wingate. I had a buddy who said, you know, Derek, I, I think you might be interested in officiating. And of course I just said, I, I don't want to referee a basketball game, I'm a player. And uh, he said, no, no, I think, I think you'd enjoy this. And first time I went out, got exposed to it, and then I said, what, this is just for me. So 11 years later of officiating, uh, I, I've had an opportunity to experience some success with that, uh, and I love it. He has enjoyed running the courts and keeping order around the region for 11 years. During that time, he's called some big games. A state championship is a great honor, and uh, I've been very blessed. I've worked uh, three public state championships and three private state championships. Uh, and all the officials I've worked with have been top class, a lot of them uh, college officials, and I've had some fantastic ball games. Maybe none more exciting, though, than a few years ago when United Faith played Word of God for a private school state championship. A gentleman by the name of John Wall, who's currently in the NBA, was the point guard for uh, a Word of God. And it came down to a last second three point shot at the buzzer, uh, which was good. And uh, United Faith won a state championship and uh, that place was crazy, that was fantastic. On the court and in the office, Derek Skinner is thankful for those who have been the key to his success. Whereas Wingate opened up the world to me, the bb &T has come back and done the same thing, giving me a lot of professional opportunities as well. As Derek said, he's very fond of his experience here at Wingate University. He and his family still live here in Union County, and he gets back to campus anytime he gets a chance. Great alum. Brian Stevenson, thanks very much. And finally here, when students return from winter break in January, faculty members found a unique way to welcome them back. It's Dr. Stringer. Happy New Year, and welcome back to Wingate. Hey, you're back. You're really back. Glad you made it. See you first thing in the morning. Welcome That's back. right, Welcome Professor's back. Selfies. Back, Faculty took to their smartphones and put together a short video that was emailed out to students on the first day of the semester. Prizes were awarded to the students who correctly identified all the professors in the video. And that's our show for this time. I'm Jeff Atkinson. Thanks for watching. Phenomenal chances in the November 4th, 2014. South Atlantic Conference Tournament Quarterfinals. He's so good at that speed play. Wingate is the defending tournament champion. With their season on the line, the game heads to overtime. It's win or go home. Turning again. Now she chips it to the far post. Trying to angle it in. It's Howell and she does it! Brooke Howell with the game winner in just the second minute. The Bulldogs have won. The quarterfinal here at the Wingate Soccer Complex. In the end, we pulled it out, and that's a win's a win. But this isn't a story about one win or one goal. It's about a breakout season for Wingate sophomore Brooke Howell, 
a season that was almost cut short after a routine doctor's appointment led to a stunning discovery. I do think she had a glimpse that, you know, something she loved so much and has done all of her life could be, could be gone pretty quick. Brooke Howell was born October 10th, 1994, the second of Tom and Melissa Howell's two children. She has a, uh, you know, a real strong personality, so what she's thinking, you know, and what she thinks, she pretty much says. She always knew exactly what she wanted to do. Um, she didn't let anybody really influence her too much. Anyone, that is, except her big brother, Chase. Typical sibling rivalry aside, the pair found common ground in the front yard kicking around a soccer ball. I was always trying to get her to play with me, out, play sports out, outside when we were growing up. And she was always really good. She always tried to keep up with me. So he pushed me to be better, and I'd play with uh, his friends, which they were like four years older than me. So we always kind of look back and go, you know, she started playing because of him. Chase would eventually choose baseball over soccer. But for Brooke, the front yard fun became something more. She started playing soccer at the Harris YMCA, I think, when she was five years old, um, and loved it from, from minute one. Um, we did encourage her to try some other things just to see um, if she would like it more. She tried basketball one year, and it was one year. Brooke's parents soon joined many other families, spending weekends carpooling to practices and more time at tournaments than at home. She was very adamant, and she stuck, to, stuck with it. Um, there were many times, you know, maybe she was getting a little frustrated, but she never said, I don't want to play or I want to stop or I don't want to play in the next year. Yeah, she had times um, playing club soccer, um, you know, different um, associations and different coaches um, look for different things. Um, she had some club experiences that, um, you know, were not real favorable uh, for her because she was not a big person. She was fast but not real strong. Um, so some of the coaches wanted, you know, bigger, stronger uh, players. So there were seasons where she didn't play a whole lot on her, on her club team. She got into those high school days. When did you start realizing that, you know, you really had a love for the game and maybe it was something you wanted to do after, after high school? Um, when my coach started talking to me about it, I was like, I think you have potential to go to the next level. And I talked to my parents and my brother about it. And I just felt like it was, the right thing to do. After making a list of potential schools, attending several soccer camps at various colleges, the choice became clear. Brooke chose Wingate University, a Division II school less than an hour drive from her childhood home in Charlotte, North Carolina. She would become a starting forward for Coach Chip Wiggins. And she came in with a lot of pace, which, which really helps, um, helps the team out, uh, you know, coupled with a, a lot of a good technical um, ability. She, uh, she loves to score goals. She loves to go forward. Um, and, you know, she also is not afraid to, to get a tackle in as well. But uh, we also felt like there was a really high ceiling there. We just needed to, to, to work with her a little bit during the offseason. Grade Brooke Howell's freshman year as a soccer player. I wanted to make my mark here, and so I went out every game as hard as possible and tried to prove myself. Uh, we went into spring season, and I lifted a lot, gained weight. I was better tactically and mentally and I just felt like I was a better player going out into the summer. And into summer, I was hoping to, I worked the camps, so I was hoping to get my, keep my foot on the ball and run around and be a teenager. But, but an annual doctor's visit quickly derailed those plans. Um, this particular doctor always does thyroid checks during that visit, and she did a check and um, she came home and she said, I have a nodule on my thyroid, and she said I should get it ultrasound and checked. We went from her being um, strong um, and thinking she's just getting ready for soccer, dealing with those things, getting ready for school, checking the box off of the annual visits with the doctor to the next thing we know, we're, we're dealing with cancer. Uh, it was honestly the worst night of my life. Uh, I remember we were at my apartment and we were sitting there and my mom takes a phone call out in the hallway and comes in and tells us. And, it was devastating. I mean, it's just cancer's not a not a word you want to hear. Your dad, you know, took you aside and told you, and you know, what, what were your reaction? What were your emotions when he, you know he said the word cancer? None. I mean, no words can describe it. Oh. Just days after learning the news, 
Brooke would undergo a six-hour surgery to remove her thyroid gland and lymph nodes. It's very unusual to have this young person getting thyroid cancer and considering her age, she did very well. I mean, she was well motivated and, and she had a great supportive family. Endocrinologist Dr. Nara Simmons took over Brooke's care after her surgery. Signs of thyroid cancer, he says, can include trouble swallowing or speaking, but oftentimes many people, like Brooke, never show symptoms of being sick. It's an incidental finding most of the time. If she didn't notice a lump, out of the examining doctor, out of the family did not notice the lump, then it could go on for a while. So that is the problem with thyroid cancer. No one likes the C word, but that's what it is. And everyone just knows about like breast cancer, leukemia and stuff like that. But thyroid cancer is actually more common than you'd expect. Um, I found that out from having it myself. But I think people should go get regularly checked because it's not something to mess with it can spread to become something more. Like a majority of thyroid cancer patients, Brooke underwent radioactive iodine treatment to destroy any remaining thyroid tissue. I couldn't work out and so it was really frustrating about not being able to work out as a college athlete. That's like what I live for. Brooke's new normal now consists of taking a daily medication in the form of a synthetic hormone used to mimic the thyroid's ability to control how quickly her body uses energy and makes proteins. When I found out about it, I thought was my first question was, when will I be able to play again? Brooke was reluctant to tell anyone the news, wanting to be back on the field without her coaches or teammates ever finding out. When she finally did say something, it was on her own terms in the locker room before preseason practice. She was really like strong and nonchalant about it all and she was always just worried about her team and her friends and stuff more than anything. There were times where I could see she was struggling a little bit, uh, whether it be physically or just mentally with everything, but um, she just keeps plugging away. She's an amazing kid. September 4th, 2014, Wingate takes on USC Aiken. Let's go girls! Number 10, Brooke Howell. Number 10 is back on the field alongside the rest of her team for the first game of the season. Let's go Brooke! What was that first game back, just knowing that she was going to be okay and she was going to get out of but just continue like things were? For me, it was very, very simple. It was, it was relief, just, just relief. I was just very anxious. I wanted her to do well. I wanted her to be, you know, just be out there and doing what she does best, but I was so anxious. And um, when I saw her out there, I was like, wow, she looks strong. That was my one of the first things I thought, I was like, wow, she looks stronger than she did last year. And um, so that was probably the biggest thing. It made me feel a little better that she looked stronger. And uh, then to watch her play, I could see it. Uh, it's just, it's almost, I've taken watching her play soccer for granted before this happened. And now I go and see her play and it's amazing. The biggest thing that I saw was that she, she was not afraid to make mistakes. She didn't care. She was just going to go play. Um, you know, there was nothing to lose in her mind, and that's how she, she played on, uh, you know, in games. Um, whereas in the past, she would be hesitant and maybe, you know, make a mistake. And she, she just uh, threw all that to the side and, and just said, you know what, I'm just going to go and play. Well, it definitely put things in perspective for our entire team. And we've all came really close. And I think it's good that we have because I feel like with our team being this close, we're a better support system for her as she goes through this. It may have made me mentally stronger and play like every game like it was my last, but I think I had, as last season I had a goal and it was, coach was like, I want you to get this amount of goals. And that was what I was looking after. And I was looking at how to make my team better. And I was just playing for them because they had been there for me so many times. Brooke would end up scoring twice in the season opener against Aiken. By the end of her sophomore season, she would be Wingate's second leading scorer, first team all-conference, and join her team in winning the 2014 South Atlantic Conference Tournament title. Major accomplishments by anyone's standards, but for strong-willed Brooke Howell, just another chance to prove she planned to approach life's obstacles one way, by going through it and moving forward. Touches to the inside. Howell, yes! What was that day like for you? Uh, what was that moment like getting back out there and realizing that you are going to be okay and you can do what you love? Um, the best. 
unforgettable. <laughs>